it's a great honor today to introduce Rain Wilson, the co-author of Soul Pancake, and also, if you may have figured out, uh, he's also plays Dwight from the series The Office. I'd like to read a quote from the introduction, uh, just to uh, set the stage for him. Um, I believe art and its expression are the same as faith and its expression. Science, too, for that matter. And quite frankly, everything that urges us to create, to love, to think deeply, to breathe in the moment, to be of service, and to be human. Uh, also joining us is Rain's friend, and to help us guide us all in this quest and discussion is Will Eno, who is a Guggenheim Fellow and also a finalist for the 2005 Pulitzer Prize in Drama. His new play, Middletown, was the winner of the 2010 uh, Horton Foote Award and premiered at the Vi uh, Vineyard Theater in New York this November. Um, the authors were also signed books um, after the talk, but no memorabilia, please. And um, for the Q&A period, please use the microphones queued up in either aisleway. Uh, don't shop from your seats. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, help me in welcoming uh, Rain and Will Eno to uh, Google New York. That's what I imagine a motivational speaker would do. <laughs> that was nice, running. Um, it's very nice to be here. I'm a tiny bit nervous. I don't normally do things like this, and I might have killed a cop on the way over here, so I'm, I'm a little I'm easy. Um, but it's very nice to be here. I've known Rain for 20 years, um, and looking around, I see a lot of um, uh, youngish people, and uh, I just was thinking it's it's good to keep in mind that you do end up if you if you're friendly and you live and you don't die, you end up knowing people for 20 years. And uh, <laughs> so if you're loving and good, as Rain has always been, then people remember that for 20 years. And if you're... Uh, I have not died in the last 20 years. I know, I know. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but how about, um, you touch on it quite a bit in the introduction, but um, how about uh, talking a little bit about um, other places that you've been in your life other than where you are now, kind of with, with respect to the world and, uh, and big things? Well, um, yeah, that's an interesting uh, segue. I, uh, I was not always um, amazing. Um, <laughs> by the way, um, I had to... I had to go to Ask Jeeves to find out where this place was. <laughs> and um, that, um, no, I had to actually call my butler Jeeves, um, <clears throat> who's on my plane. And he, was, he asked my pilot to punch it in. Anyways, they eventually Googled it. And I got here. Um, I, uh, yeah, OK. How do I answer that question? I believe that, uh, and I talk about this in my introduction of the book, which is only the tiniest fraction of what the Soul Pancake book is, but um, uh, as I, at the ripe old age of 44, when I look back on my life, I see it as one uh, enormous uh, creative and spiritual journey. And uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a miraculous ride, and, um, and somehow or other, I've ended up here at the Google headquarters um, talking about a book. How's that? That's good. That's good. Um, uh, so where Rain is a, is a deep and dark and uh, full uh, sort of figure, so I'm sure we're going to get into some difficult stuff. So I just wanted to start with a definition of terms. OK. Maybe. Um, so Webster's Dictionary defines a pancake as a thin, flat cake of batter cooked in a pan or on a griddle, a griddle cake of flapjack. Agree? I agree. I think that, <laughs> um, I think that, that definition pretty much sums up what a pancake <laughs> it does. is it all does. about. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 We'll um, go with that. Yeah. Uh, so the book, in a great way, uh, the book it, it, um, it's Are there any questions? No. <laughs> and this is great. Good. Could we get four of those Google phones up here? Is that possible? <laughs> 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 um, uh, 
Um, now the book is a, it's a absolutely a, uh, a destination. You know, you can, it's sitting on your table and you can go into it, but then it also, it's as a, as a starting point, it's a really, really great thing. It's kind of like a very gentle game of truth or dare or something like that for people to kind of kick around with. Yeah, the book is many things and um, it has essays in it, little ones. It has lots of art in it. Um, it has many of life's big questions, which uh, I'll get to more uh, later as I talk about uh, artistic and spiritual journeys, creative journeys, technological journeys. Um, You're going to talk about that later? No. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, that's, I can't, I can't speak to that. But uh, yeah, this is, this is um, a lot of what we have in the book is um, a lot of creative, Challenges. This would be a great book for people to have. To uh, this would be great on a date. Um, <laughs> let me, I'm gonna just go go back to the beginning a little bit. Hi, welcome everybody, all you latecomers. Oh, you're too busy googling things up there <laughs> to come and get a chair. All right, tracksuit. Um, <laughs> so when I started getting uh, well known for doing the office, I um, uh, I really wanted to do something positive and unique on the internet because there's so little, uh, uh, there's so much crap out there. And, um, uh, and, and when I was a teenager, I was every kind of nerd. Um, I was even on the computer club for a while and I programmed in basic a little bit. Yeah, yes. And, uh, uh, but I was also in Model United Nations and band and debate and uh, I was on the chess team. Uh, we were undefeated that year. Um, no thanks to me. I was fifth board, you know, so I don't know if you know how that means. There's, you play your top five players, okay? I was the fifth best in Shortcrest High School in Seattle, Washington. Woo! Um, no one went there. Um, and, uh, but one of the kinds of nerds that I was was a, uh, a philosophy and spirituality nerd. I took a lot of great books courses where instead of writing papers, we debated things and talked about big ideas. And uh, it was my favorite thing to do. I even, um, a group of friends and I, when I was uh, a freshman in college, we decided it would be a great idea. Um, we discovered caffeine. There weren't Starbucks back then. And they didn't, coffee was just like, it was like coffee farts, like someone, <laughs> ate a coffee bean and farted in a glass of water. And that's what, that's what coffee tasted like for, for decades. And um, we, uh, so they called it Folgers or something like that. And so we went to this cafe at the University of Washington. Um, it was called Last Exit to Brooklyn. And we drank um, these things called espresso floats. And they had like triple shots of espresso with coffee beans churned in there. We didn't even know what caffeine was or, or coffee beans. And we would drink this thing and we would just be instantly filled with the most amazingly great ideas. And one of the great ideas we had was, let's take my whole philosophy book collection, go up to Capitol Hill and wrap philosophy for money. And we'll make them enough money to go back and buy more espresso floats. <laughs> so we, uh, we went up there, it's a true story, and um, we, we would rap to Rousseau and Kant and Nietzsche and, um, you know, and we were just out freestyling to these philosophers. We thought it was just the most amazing. We were just flying so high at that point. Like, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. We're going to blow people's minds. And um, we had a hat out. And we were making all kinds of money. And then someone stole our hat with all our money. And we left. And then we had a caffeine crash. And then it all ended poorly. But uh, that's to say that um, so the stuff of what this book is, uh, is philosophical uh, and creative and spiritual journeys, um, I was very intrigued with at a young age. And so I had this great opportunity to start a website, soulpancake.com. Um, it, uh, it has like triple the, the, uh, the usage of Google. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's out of the park, soulpancake.com. And then we decided that this would be a great companion piece to the website. Um, so a roundabout way of, of answering Will's question is that um, uh, this is a companion piece, piece to the website, but it also stands alone in that um, it's about promoting discussion. There's no answers in this book. Uh, there's no answers on the website. Um, too many people know all the answers all the time. 
I mean, even, even newscasters have the answers to how everything should work. Um, uh, but it, it's all about, we realized as we were building Soul Pancake, like it really is all about the questions. And whether you're an atheist or you're a born-again Christian or a Buddhist or a Sikh or agnostic or you've never thought twice about it, we all have to deal with death and love and, uh, and regret and free will and uh, family and uh, all of these things that, that present so many of life's big questions. And so um, I was just thrilled to be able to, to launch something like this. And my other... Uh, my co-writers and my co so Pancake team members are right here. Stand up, you guys. Devin and Golries and Shabnam, stand up. Um, aren't they cute? Aren't they adorable? So, yeah, what else? I'm sorry, I'm a million miles away. Say that again? <laughs> When I no. was a teenager, oh, okay. <laughs> um, the, the, um, you remind me of it. There's a great piece of, um, I think is, this guy is sort of a uh, Jewish mystic type, but his, the quote is, um, uh, the answer is the order of the questions. And the way the book unfolds and the order of the questions in it are, uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a very nice, meaningful, and uh, sort of gently directed um, um, uh, experience to go through it. Um, because that's how you read books. You start. You start at the top. Right, yeah, and the left. Who said that? Do you remember Maimonides? Was that? Uh, Yabez, Ed, Edmund Yabez. Yabez. Who has a, a book called uh, The Book of Questions. Oh, does he really? Yeah. We can need to get that. Could we get so, that? Could someone Google four that? Four of those Google phones up here at the Yeah, phone? and that um, <laughs> we <laughs> categorized all the questions into uh, nine chapters. Um, Brain and the soul, art and creativity, experiences and emotions, love, sex, and relationships, virtues and vices, introspection, reflection, and identity, God and religion, science and technology. Woo! Woo! Um, life, death, and living, and who is going to replace Steve Carell on The Office? So. Um. So a quick, uh, some, um, just to per maybe people are interested in your personal life. Is there, is there a Mr. Wilson in the picture other than your dad and I guess you? My grandpa. Okay. Yeah. He's dead. <laughs> yeah. No, but you're very proud of uh, Holly and Walter. And, uh, yeah, I have a wife named Holly uh, who I love. We've been together for 20 years, married for 15. And uh, I have a son, Walter. We've been together for six years. Um, <laughs> and... Um, you remind me of me when I was that age. Um, and uh, yes, I have a family. Um, my wife and I had sex, and we created a son. Um, true story. No, true story. True story. Uh, <laughs> basically, well, no, actually, well, now that I think of it, but. <laughs> okay. Just to go more into detail on that, she disrobed. Um, <laughs> Um, what else you got? Uh, I would love to get into questions. I don't really know what else to say here. Yeah, the, um, but the, but I want to. Uh, there's something I do want you to say, or yeah. both of us to somehow get towards saying. But um, in a in a in a great way, you've always been the way you are. Um, in a in a deep and real way, but then also, um, uh, or um, seeds of you. Have all, you've mm -hmm. always been there in some form that has gotten uh, stronger and clearer and um, uh, and all sorts of great things. And I don't want to get, I, I couldn't get too deep into philosophy because I don't know that much. But um, uh, whatever we call the soul, um, do you think of it as something that can um, increase or um, uh, progress or uh, grow? That's interesting. Um, Isn't it? <laughs> I, um, the soul is a weird one, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts and if we have a soul. I think the word soul is, is, is weirdly, um, uh, is weirdly used because, uh, you know, many religious beliefs say, oh, we have an eternal soul, um, and they have a very specific view of what that is, I think, and then, uh, and then we, we know what, like, soulfulness is 
in music, but there seems to be a disconnect. Um, I grew up uh, a member of the Baha'i faith, and that informed a lot of um, where my thirst and my curiosity for all different religious beliefs and philosophies came from, and my parents encouraged that. Um, they would invite uh, born-again Christians into the house with the watchtowers to, you know, to talk about uh, the Bible, and we would have, you know, Buddhist monks stay with us, and we had bo books on, you know, Egyptian mysticism and Sikhism, and, uh, and it was a really fun uh, household in that respect, um, uh, other than the fact that we all hated ourselves. And then um, the uh, true story. And uh, then I went through a long period of time of um, really questioning all that. And I really decided there could not be a god and that god was a construct uh, and that only the weak needed god. And, um, and so much evil had been perpetrated in the name of religion. How could religion possibly be uh, relevant to this day and age? And that's, I talk about this in my introductions. So I'm not going to just uh, tell you the whole thing right now. But um, basically, uh, as, I, as I came through my 20s and discovered that um, uh, I was unhappy, um, even though I'd become an artist, which was my dream, and I, I moved to, N to New York, and I shaved my head and dyed my hair black and smoked filterless cigarettes, and I became a bohemian. And I was doing off-off-Broadway plays, and I was doing workshops with Andre Gregory, where we were doing plastiques, uh, where we were doing these body deconstructions for hours, sweating in weird lofts in the, in the meatpacking district. You know? And I was like, this is my dream come true. I was getting paid to be an actor. I was like, oh my god, I'm an artist. I'm an actor. I'm living in New York. This is awesome. But I was really, really unhappy. And that, I think that's when we all go on journeys, is when we are get unhappy enough all of a sudden we get unhappy enough and then the needle goes eh, and then we go, I need to do something about this. I need to figure out what that is and it could be through therapy or through travel or, 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 or breaking up with someone or whatever we do to kind of uh, unravel that. But I went, then I described this long spiritual journey. But basically, what long story short is what I came to realize is that um, I came back to my faith but more importantly, what I learned from that journey is that it's all the same thing. And this was supported by my faith. I think it's supported by all the faiths in the world. And that's what um, that, uh, the, the young man who introduced me, um, I'm going to call him Chip. I don't know what his name is. Um, uh, he, Lee. Lee. Don't care. Um, he. Uh, terrible, terrible person. He, terrible, terrible he's man. a terrible, terrible man. No, he's you a terrible man. <laughs> He's, oh, I am? What? I'm sorry. Again, I was... Um, <laughs> what was... <laughs> um, the, uh, so what I came back to is that it's all the same thing, is that um, uh, my basic, my personal belief, which really doesn't have to do with the book, this is just what I think, but it, it maybe is filtered through the book a little bit, is that there's not any difference. Um, we, as human beings long to transcend. We want more than just the material. I think even people, even, uh, even Bill Maher or Christopher Hitchens or any of the, you know, the adamant God deniers still are yearning for something. They still are reaching for something. They're still doing more than just eating and shitting and fucking and sleeping and, uh, and accruing wealth. They're, they're wanting more than that. They're wanting to connect, they're wanting to create art, they're wanting to make the world a better place, they're wanting to increase discussion, whatever that is. But soulfulness is, I think, human uh, beings wanting to transcend just the ordinary. And uh, that can be through making music and making art, that can be through exploring the limits of science and technology and mathematics and uh, striving to go beyond just the material world, it can go through an expression of, of prayer or devotion, to be devout. Um, and that uh, this is an expression of the soul. So I think that we all have souls. We all have that uh, uh, an energy in us and about us that wants to do more than just be a monkey. And uh, this soul can 
I believe when exercised uh, and can grow and flourish and become more and more radiant, and that's really what life is all about. But I don't think that you need religion necessarily to do it. I think that you just need uh, to, one just needs to engage uh, in the day, in this moment right now, all that exists is boom, right here, here we are, and there it's gone, boom, and now, 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 and this is where we live, and um, uh, that's, it's about the striving, and the striving creates, creates soul. Oh my gosh, what'd you do? You spilled that. Was it water? Okay, good. Um, is there anyone here on the Google towels. janitorial staff? Can we get some paper towels and some of those free iPhones. The Google janitorial. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Um, this is weird. This is your lunch hour. Is that what's going on? What What happens after this? You go back to work. What are you guys working on? <laughs> are any of you guys taking uh, pictures out on the streets of the of the things for the Google Maps? <laughs> Who here works on Google Maps? Who here works on Google app, apps? Who works on the search engine? Who works on the servers? Who works in the cafeteria? Uh, who works on the phone? Nobody? You do? You're the one person. Um, what else does Google do? Keep YouTube. Going, this is gold. This is gold. Keep going. <laughs> who, works on, who works on YouTube's? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. I have a thought. I, uh, I saw a guy speak last night named uh, uh, Slava Zizek. Do you know that guy? No. Uh, Slovenian philosophy guy. He wrote, he has, he has a great book called In, In Defense of Lost Causes, and uh, he did a great thing called The Pervert's Guide to Cinema, which is unbelievable. Oh, yes, uh, I've heard about stuff. that book, yeah. Um, but he was, saying, he was quoting Kierkegaard last night, and I thought of you and the Baha'i thing, because he was saying that uh, uh, Kierkegaard said, in the 1800s or whenever Kierkegaard was, uh, that any div divinity student, any theology student, could lay out Christianity much better than Christ ever did. You know, they could describe the whole thing, and it it very clearly made it all seem like a just an ongoing conversation. That the, hmm. the world religions are this this long, rich, deep debate, um, moving toward ever. ever um, I don't know how to I don't know what to put after ever, but um toward clarity and toward uh, uh, some, not final vision, but um, full, the fullest vision. Yeah, and the fullest vision, uh, I think they, uh, uh, I think religion does an awful lot of damage in the world, but I think that religion, I think that we as a society right now are kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of religion, just saying like, well, it's all a bunch of crap. And that's easy to say when you see what's done in the name of religion, but it's also easy to just throw the baby out the, with the bathwater and, and not notice that there are some things about religious faith that are um, beautiful and true and lasting uh, yeah. in the same way that there are things about science and art that are beautiful, true, and lasting. So, No, that's true. He also, this guy, Zizek, also had an interesting point, which was, and I, I couldn't agree more, and that it seems like that wonder is the, that's the important thing, and that's sort of mm -hmm. not knowing and wonder and striving toward that there must be reasons and great, grand, beautiful reasons. Um, but he was saying, well, I think that's what, um, hold that thought, on the, um, <laughs> this, uh, uh, what this book, uh, what Life's Big Questions does is hopefully it engages that sense of wonder um, and the sense of asking and, again, yearning and searching because I think that um, the easiest thing, I guess what, what I say that I'm all about is that the easiest thing in the world to do is to be cynical. Uh, it's, it's, it's an easiest fallback position to, to know it all, to be over it, to be cut off from, to be withdrawn from, to, uh, to, to know better than others, to, uh, to be pissy and sarcastic and uh, all of those things. Like it's, it's a really easy position to be in. It's actually really hard to be present, engaged, and open-hearted. And um, but I think that's what uh, we can all uh, aspire to. And uh, I think that engaging in the questions helps us get there. Does that make sense? 
You guys didn't think you were gonna get this kind of talk, did you? <laughs> when I started on The Office, we had so many fun, so many. John uh, Krasinski. Uh, just a quick thing, so you're on this show, The Office, in which you guys all play people, you work in this office. Um, was that in the script? Or was that something you came up with on the fly? <laughs> So um, I, uh, we should take, take some questions if people have questions. Yeah, so. good. Uh, hi, Rain um, and Will. Hi. I uh, have a question about heartbreak and if this is part of the book and what your take on it is and how it affects the soul pancake <laughs> and if, um, if you've gone through it and that kind of thing. I don't know if that's in scope, but I hope you have some thoughts on this, not that I've dealt with it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, do you have something you need to get off your chest? <laughs> I was just waiting for you guys to get here, you know. <laughs> just got a lot, what's a lot your name? On. What's um, your name, buddy? My name's Ryan. No, what's her name? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> or his name, I don't know. Um, Kim. Really? No. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is on YouTube. I can't do that. <laughs> uh, I had, I experienced heartbreak not far from this building. Um, my first <laughs> real girlfriend uh, was named Catherine, and Will actually was our roommate, and this is in the late 80s. And uh, Catherine, she was from New Zealand. And uh, she, uh, uh, she, uh, she broke up with me, and that sucked, and I was heartbroken, and she lived on 19th, we used to live on 19th, uh, between 8th and 9th, right up here, and then I stalked her for a long while because I was sure she was seeing someone else and I was sat across the street from her on the stoop and I cried and I wept and I had tears pouring down my face. I was like, why, God, why? And um, was it the six? <laughs> <laughs> it was the six. Um, uh, and uh, so I've experienced heartbreak. Yeah, sure. Any advice that you might give the people? <laughs> okay, <it's fine. laughs> what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Boom. True. How's that? You can Thanks. quote me on that. Hi. Hi. Um, why do you think there's such a strong link between funny people and comedians and wanting to talk about philosophy and large issues like this? Is there? I think so. Was there, is there really funny people who wanting to talk I, it about? It seems like a connection that I make a lot. Stephen Fry. Good example of that. Yeah, kind of Stephen Fry. That's very true. Stephen Hawking. Um, uh, well, I think that um, um, there's something to the. I don't know. It, it, get, it can sound very pretentious very easily to talk about comedy and pain, but you have to kind of know something of of pain to experience comedy or be funny, I think. Um, except for Krasinski. I don't think he's ever had any pain in his life. <laughs> and he's a very funny human being. So that's all bets are off with him. And ravishly handsome. Um, <laughs> ravishingly. Does he like philosophy? I'm sorry? Does he like philosophy? No, nah, I don't think he'd give a rat's ass about Maybe philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, know, I know you don't care what I think, but I actually I haven't <laughs> thought about this. <clears throat> Not you, but you. Yeah. Um, but I actually think, when I think of really funny people that I know, I, th I think from a very early age, people who know, feel just some kind of discomfort in life or find life painful in some way, start to very deeply need to transform any situation into another situation, which I think is kind of a, a, a root of both philosophy and, and comedy in a way, of just yeah. seeing, seeing a thing and then tilting it four degrees. Um, so that it's another thing. I think that there's something to comedy too about like, I was always interested in like, why is something funny? Like that's really, why is that funny? Why is that funny? It wasn't enough for it to just be funny. And I think that same question of like, why is that funny? Or then, then it goes to like, why is that true? Or why do I feel that way? There's that same kind of searching thing. I know, uh, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not really. Sorry, I couldn't answer your question very well. <laughs> This is weird. Hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of the show. You're a male model. Steve. You're a male model? No. no. <laughs> you and, uh, you're in my Land's End catalog. <laughs> no, I'm not, actually. <laughs> no, I just saw you. You were selling a tote bag. Turn around and just go like this. Uh, I left it over on my chair over there, actually. Sorry. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of the show, and and uh, I'm looking forward to reading the book. Show? I, this show, this show, this show is great. I haven't read your book, but this is this makes me interested in it. But it also, you seem very different than Dwight Schrute right now, and I, I'm wondering if you could tell us like where your motivation for that character came. It seems uh, different from Rain Wilson, so I'd be interested to know sort of how you how you developed Dwight Schrute as a character. Um, yeah, well, a lot of Dwight Schrute I stole from the guy who played Gareth on the English show. Um, who's brilliant, Mackenzie Crook. And um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of my family is uh, kind of uh, trailer trash, uh, <laughs> South Seattle um, uh, muscle car types. And uh, I really wanted an aspect of that to be part of Dwight. And, um, and, uh, and I, I, I went to uh, high school with a guy named Chris Cole who had the same Dwight glasses and uh, only they were, they were, they had the words Battlestar Galactica on the sides of it. <laughs> I am not making that up. <laughs> this is 1980, people. 1980, he had Battlestar Galactica Dwight glasses back then. He loved fencing, Dungeons and Dragons. He went into the army as a coronet player. Uh, <laughs> And so um, I grew up with a killed. lot of Dwight. It's a sad story. He was, he, he was decapitated. Uh, he was, it's a sad, sad story. But, and he was yeah, decapitated. Yeah. No. Um, and he's, yeah, he's killed hundreds of people in <laughs> wars. No, not really. But so I don't know. It's, I feel like it's part of me. It's part of my roots and stuff like that. And I, uh, I play fascists good, and I play nerds good. And so I blended the two, and it kind of worked out. So. Thanks. Good luck with that modeling career. Yeah. So you kind of uh, mentioned that you used to go to Capitol Hill and rap some philosophy. I was wondering if you could give us a demo. Um. <laughs> Do you have that thing? Do you have that thing? <laughs> the, that rap? That one rap? Yeah. It's on my posterous account. Go find it. So I'm gonna look that up. So we'll do it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot, jerk. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. I was really gonna try to work out some sort of the soullessness of offices and trying to bring Google into a really soulful place. But really, I just wanted to give you this droid that we made uh, of Dwight for Halloween. It's a zombie. So if you wanna kind of talk about the soullessness of zombies, that's zombies. Too. Yeah. Why don't zombies eat other zombies? I mean, they're wandering around. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is, um... They're wandering around. There's plenty of other zombies out there. Do you know what I mean? Like, just like, they're like, Argh, oh, another zombie, Argh. Why does it, it doesn't make any sense. Yes? Uh, how come you didn't ask me if I'm a model? Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Um, so I think that as an individual, it's pretty easy to question religion and explore lots of different things. But I'm curious, as a parent, how that translates into raising a kid and how you've chosen to uh, sort of incorporate that into raising a child. Um, well, that's a very good question. I think that. Uh, I learned so much from my son, and I learned so much about what I was talking about, about um, being fully engaged in the stuff of life from my son, because he's incapable of being cynical. He's incapable of being over something. I mean, I think very soon they start to experience that as they learn it from their peers and stuff like that, but everything that he sees is, is a little miracle. I mean, it does the way cereal floats in a bowl, the way that this screen is on an angle, this and who, how they get the antennas in there. And it, when you have children, um, most of you won't because you'll be working your whole lives um, uh, for Larry and Sergey, Sergey. Uh, but uh, uh, I, so I learn a ton from him. But I think that um, I believe that our uh, we we owe it to our children to give them a spiritual education, and that can be whether you're religious or not. But that spiritual education is to show them their place in the universe, teach them um, 
about service, um, teach them uh, uh, virtues. There are eternal virtues that work whether you're of a uh, faith uh, community or not. Uh, kindness, compassion, humility, um, truthfulness, all of these things are uh, need to be fostered in a child, and, they, and those are taught best at the home, um, not necessarily in schools, although I think a lot of schools are moving in that direction, and it's, and it's a really good thing. And uh, so it's very important for me to engage my son in that, in that spiritual education. And, our, and all of our spiritual education never stops, really. It's not something like, oh, I have my diploma in my, in my spiritual education. It continues going. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you a model? <laughs> <laughs> Did you work for North Face? <laughs> uh, Take your hand off your hip. <laughs> uh, speaking of parenting, I was just wondering if your wife I will not is adopt going to, you. Uh, what? <laughs> wondering if your wife is going to redeem her punch card for four more babies. Wait, what? <laughs> the joke is dead. For four more, I don't understand. I, I'm tr I wish the I knew office, what that Angela meant. Angela, ring bell. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sit down. <laughs> what do you What do you work on, man? Google Docs. On what? Google Docs. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why don't you work on like Google Lasers? Something really cool, Google spacecraft. G Google genetics, cloning. Yes. Hi, so you mentioned a certain question, which was why are things funny? How analytically do you approach that? Do you literally take a joke and rip it apart and say like, oh, this changed? Or do you take more philosophical approach to it? Well, I think that's the magic of uh, making art is that you can philosophize about it all you want, but then there's the ineffable, ineffable, intangible thing that happens that is inexplicable. You can, as a musician, you can study, like, why is something, why is a melody moving? And you can diagram all these different melodies, and you can write a melody, but then ultimately it, it's, you've got to hit a point where it, it kind of transforms and, um, uh, and, and, and transcends, and that's the... The, what's mysterious about the arts. And do you think that's mysterious about science or computer programming, too? Does it work that way? Can you figure it all out with your head? Or does inspiration and intuition, here's a life speak question for you. Does inspiration and intuition uh, guide anything of what you do uh, when you're programming or creating something at a place like Google? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah? How? <laughs> you would seem to know the answer to that, I bet. Strangely enough, I do not. You don't. Anyone? Who wants to speak to that? Well, yeah? The people who create programming languages or programming tools kind of try to do that by letting people express whatever ideas they have most eloquently or most optimally. Interesting. So You look like you, yeah, you got something to say there, yeah. So we have things like codes, mails, like we, you take a look at a like, like piece of code and then like, you realize something is not is fishy, but sometimes don't know exactly what that is. Yeah. Um, and then that's kind of like some sort of intuition you have, like uh, when at least at, when look at code. We actually try to formalize those like code smells, so it becomes more analytical. But there are like there is some aspect. It's like Keanu Reeves when everything can, turns into numbers, and he's like <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's more the other way. You anthropomorphize code, and oh, not anthropomorphize. You make it say like this part smells bad. I don't. That's the way of saying I don't like it. I guess. I don't speak any of that <laughs> language, but yeah. Do you have a question there? Thank you. Uh, yes, I do. So you were speaking about the sense of wonder, and that a lot of musing on philosophy or religion really serves to answer questions that we cannot answer adequately through other means. But as the purview of science and information increases the sphere of religion or philosophy decreases. We no longer have to uh, assume that every lightning bolt falls for a reason and is targeted by an angry god. So do you see perhaps the shrinking of the role of religion in our life as a natural consequence of the expansion of science? Are we here, as part of Google, killing wonder by giving people better real answers? That's an awesome question. Uh, let's give them an applause for that question. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. I'll speak to that. I think that, um, first of all, it's a kind of arrogance to say that religious thought could be equated to like, oh, this angry God threw a lightning bolt down. I think that that's uh, really reductivist. I think that if someone was talking about science and being like, oh, I put a magic thing in a test tube, nah, nah, nah. no, science can cure cancer and we can heal people and we can make our lives easier and better. Like, we have to be careful not to reduce both sides of the equation because I think ultimately religion and science have to walk hand in hand. And by religion, I don't mean organized specific religions. I mean that, again, that thought, that interest in uh, attuning with the eternal or with the divine or transcending uh, what it is beyond just being a, you know, an eating, shitting monkey. Um, and uh, so I think that we're in a, ch our culture is in a vast change right now. And definitely science is superseding um, religion. And again, religion isn't superstition, and that's different than religion, although certain religions have superstitious elements still, still lodged within them. But I think that as we go forward as a culture, I think we'll find, there's, first of all, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I don't think, and I'm, not, I'm no scientist, but I don't think that science has the explanation for everything. I think, I think we still don't know what gravity is. We still don't know that light, what light is. It's still, it, it's a beam, it's a wave, it's a particle, it's a, we don't know exactly what it is. You can say, well, yes it is, it's this formula. No, but you can't, you could get the biggest light expert in the world and they can't quite tell you there's something still not there. We still don't know what the real building blocks of matter is. I don't think that science, I don't think that's what science is, is providing the concrete answers in the same way that I don't think religion provides the concrete answers. So I think we're in this phase right now, societally, where science is on the forefront and it's gonna keep going and that's great. And more and more people are gonna be like, because you hear people all the time saying, I don't believe in religion, I believe in science. It's like, well, okay, let's see how science handles those broken hearts. Let's see how science handles when someone dies or when you're grieving or when you feel immense love because science can't answer all of the questions of what it is to be human. That we, but science is, is a beautiful expression of, of, of human. I think an expression of the design. I think God's greatest creation is science. And uh, I think that they will, they will uh, eventually, if humankind is to survive, that science and religion will be, uh, uh, will be walking hand in hand, and not even like side by side, but we'll see that they're the same thing. I think that ultimately that's what it's about, right? that art and science and religion, faith, are all, uh, they're all one thing. Again, it's that God essence that flows through all of our molecules that um, seeks to transcend uh, just this, this chair. So, yeah, go. Sorry, Rand, your parents were driving. They had set out on a trip to, no. Um, we should wrap it up and show the trailer. Is that what oh, this okay, says? great. Um, one more question and we'll wrap right. it up, yeah. Uh, all right, uh, I can't believe I have to follow that last question, but. Uh, um, so the premise of The Office is that it's this, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're dumbing it down a little bit, um, is that this Office staff is being filmed for this ongoing documentary yes. or a reality show. I was just wondering, do the characters on this show watch this show? And if it hasn't been released yet, will they? Yeah, we talk about that a lot on The Office. I think that the documentary crew just it has eternal funding and they have, uh, they have two, two cameramen and a couple sound guys and some producers and stuff like that. And they're just like, oh my God, I can't believe all the gold we're getting on this typical American workplace. Let's just keep filming and filming and filming and filming. And, uh, but you know, they did that on the English show where at the very tail end of the English show, the documentary on The Office had aired and they'd all become kind of minor celebrities. Um, we talk about heading in that direction in the office, but as soon as you do that, you gotta end the show. So I'm not sure exactly when or how that would happen, but it would be a hell of a lot of fun if Dwight Schrute were a celebrity and you followed Dwight Schrute around in his life and people were just showing up at his beet farm asking for autographs because they had watched The Office and they just can't believe that such a person exists. So it's, it's very metaphysical. It's much like the Soul Pancake book. And speaking of, uh, speaking of that, um, I hope you'll each pick up a few dozen copies for stocking stuffers. And um, uh, let's show that uh, little trailer we made.
Do you want to set it up for us? This is a, a documentary about people enjoying the Soul Pancake book. <laughs> no, I mean, could you go back and set it up for us? Because I don't. Think oh, okay. <laughs> charge here. Is that it? Good? Larry, Sergey, are we done? Um, thank you guys so much for giving up your lunch period and having me and Will here. His new play, uh, Middletown, is at the Vineyard Theater. I'm going tonight. You should all go see it, because he's an absolutely genius playwright of the first rank and order. And uh, your children will be performing scenes in drama class from Willino plays. Uh, so get to know him now. Um, tear off a chunk of his sweater. And uh, thank you very much for having me.